and and live transcript. I thought you were still in Newport, Joanne. I am. Ah. Narragansett. All right, I'm gonna let everyone in and we'll start the meeting. Yep. Megan, do you want, do you have the dashboard that you wanna share or I could bring it up either way? Either way is fine. Okay, I'll allow you to do it. So you have control. Okay, Joanne, all yours. All right, I'm just um I'm just looking at the uh, agenda one second. Okay. Okay. All right. <sighs> Welcome everyone. Can you can you hear me? Is that okay? Yes. Um, today is Thursday, July 28th, and it is 5.34 p.m. This is a meeting of the Northampton Board of Health. Um, this meeting is uh, being recorded, um, and um, tonight we have with us um, board members, Dr. Suzanne Smith, Nurse Dallas Dukar and myself, Dr. Joanne Levin. Um, uh, Dr. Cynthia Suopis will be absent due to a family emergency. Um, we also have um, staff from the Department of Health, Director Meredith O'Leary. Is Amy on? Let's see. I don't see anybody. Um, there's Amy. Amy Hutchins, what is your title? Director of Environmental something health. health okay <laughs> um kelly do i see kelly kelly constantine our clerk and we will meet our new epidemiologist um megan um harvey in just a minute um so we'll start with um public comment session um and um we are always interested in hearing from people um we uh generally limit um comments to two minutes um, and um, is there, if there's anyone here for public comment, please raise your electronic or real hand. Um, I may or may not be able to see your real hand. I do see one hand up, Wendy. Is there anyone else here for public comment? Okay, Suzanne, if you would do us the pleasure of timing two minutes. Um, and Meredith, if you if you would please unmute um, Wendy, you're on Wendy. You can unmute yourself. Okay, good. Right. And uh, I'd like to say hello with my view, <laughs> but I don't see that option. Uh, but anyway, there's an old nice picture of me up. So first of all, thank you all. I'm so grateful I have you as my public health people uh, been very um, and I my heart is broken for all of the hard work and difficulty you've been through. I'm just commenting tonight on um, the cannabis issue. Um, I sent an email last week to Meredith and Sean. Here's what I wrote. I am work wondering whether the Board of Health, the Department of Health and Human Services and Community Care are discussing issues relative to the proposed cannabis re retail store for Florence, both as it relates to the location and to the numbers of cannabis retail shops in Northampton. Please share my inquiry with members of the Board of Health. I see no contact info for them on the website. Please respond to my question. I have not heard back. Um, I'm here to ask directly, the Department of Health and Human Services is deeply involved in substance abuse and prevention education programs, coalitions, and managing several grants bringing thousands of dollars into the department. 
the connection between this work and the surfeit of, of um, cannabis retail operations, I think are clear um, and, and of con concern. Um, since I, I wrote the email last week, I've learned a lot and heard from many people who share my concerns, both about the proposed site for the new cannabis shop and Northampton being touted in the media as the cannabis capital of Massachusetts. I understand capping retail cannabis licenses may be on the table for the city council. I do not know if the Board of Health and or Health and Human Services Department has discussed or been invited to be in the conversation with city officials regarding the city's policies related to cannabis, either currently or before. You're the experts. I believe you should be in these conversations. I encourage you to walk the talk and make the connections. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else here for public comment? Meredith, if you have an answer or any comments, you're welcome to say them now or once we open the meeting, um, but if not, that's okay too. Um, so um, thank you, Wendy. Um, so now we will... Um, would anyone like to make a motion to open the Board of Health meeting? Oh, you're muted, Suzanne. I see your mouth moving. <laughs> Move to open the meeting. Do I hear a second? I second it. Thank you. Uh, all in favor, Suzanne? Yes. Dallas? Yes. Joanne? Yes. OK, Board of Health meeting is officially open. Um, and uh, Meredith, did you want to start by introducing um, Megan? You're muted too. Two and a half years and I still do that. <laughs> so Megan Harvey, uh, Megan Ward Harvey, excuse me, is an, epi an epidemiologist that we currently hired to um, help with our dashboard work that Vivian Franklin used to do for us. So um, she earned her PhD in public health from UMass Amherst and is an assistant professor at health studies at Springfield College. But I'm going to ask Megan to unmute herself and she can give a little more of her bio, if you wouldn't mind, and then present this week's dashboard. And this week, we're just kind of using as a pilot. I asked her, I let her know that um, the board might have questions, comments, or like to see anything different. She's open to doing anything that we'd like within reason, of course. So um, I'm going to hand it over to Megan and go ahead. All right. Well, hi, it's nice to be joining all of you. Thank you for that uh, intro. Um, I do indeed uh, have a PhD in epidemiology uh, and biostats from UMass. Uh, let's see, I've been doing this for about 10 years um, in my pre-COVID life. I studied maternal and child health, particularly pregnant moms in the Springfield area um, who are high risk. Uh, and then COVID happened and sort of every epidemiologist uh, got tapped to <laughs> start translating science to their communities. Um, I have learned in the past two and a half years that I'm by far not the only epidemiologist who uh, is doing this. And um, while it's been great to be able to serve my communities, I wish it wasn't in this way, but here we are. So um, I've been helping out um, some of the school, local school districts, figuring out like what do these recommendations mean? And then before recommendations, like how do we navigate this without recommendations um, and doing the dashboard for East Hampton for a while. Um, and yeah, and, and during the academic year, I teach uh, public health and health sciences at Springfield College. Um, so I do- Welcome yeah. aboard. Thank you, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah. We did uh, make a, a draft um, of the dashboard this week and we have some numbers and I can, I don't know if that got sent around. I'll also share the screen. Share the screen, please. I only sent it to Joanne. Okay. Um, for comments. So yeah, if you wouldn't mind introducing the dashboard, that would be great. Sure. Um, so here it is. Uh, we kept it uh, pretty much uh, very similar to how Vivian had it. Um, just differences in terms of formatting, um, what makes sense in my head to, you know, 
where to put the boxes together. Um, I think I did uh, remove one box that Vivian had been reporting of home tests. Um, we sort of talked to each other and agreed that that probably wasn't of the most use. And then I think I might've added um, something along the lines, total cases perhaps. So you might see a few small changes here and there, but it primarily has the same uh, information. Um, and as Meredith said, I'm happy to go back and forth and you know have this reflect whatever it is that you would like to see. Uh, the way it's form formulated right now, the top box is Northampton specific metrics. So I have the seven day and the 14 day average. Um, you know, we can think about if it's helpful to have both of them, particularly in light of, um, you know, ongoing awareness of the underreporting of actual cases. Um, but traditionally, it's been nice to have sort of the shorter seven day, um, more flexible metric, just that gives us a nicer sort of uh, idea of where things are heading this week, 14 days, especially on a Thursday from the two weeks that ended before is sort of already old information. So that's sort of the justification for why that has been included. Um, so we have the seven day and the 14 day uh, case rate and test positivity, and then just some general information about where things stand in the past week or so, and then all time, all in Northampton. And that middle box uh, is color coded to match the CDC um, county levels as they are assigned. Uh, and on the bottom of the dashboard, I know it's quite small, but if you pinch, you should be able to see as a reference sort of what we're referring to with those color codings as uh, communities as low risk, medium risk, or high risk. Um, and this is sort of the new updated version of things where uh, in order to be high risk, it really requires substantial burden on the local healthcare system. So um, as Vivian had done, we sort of have both visuals in here to, to show that at this point, the burden on the healthcare system in really all of Western Massachusetts is pretty minimal. Um, but if you look to see what actual transmission rates are like out there, it's everywhere. Uh, and you probably didn't need for me to tell you that probably within your own networks uh, and your own families, you are seeing that um, BA5 is, is out there big time. Megan, uh, yes. do you think we can actually denote that difference between um, the C uh, CDC county risk level versus transmission? I've got two emails actually when we put this up on our Okay. our website the other day people not understanding the difference wow. so if we can just note that that would be fantastic i got my my notebook here okay <laughs> thank you yeah i've often thought that we should do that so i think that's a great idea and to clarify that the cdc map that often looks green does not take into account um, other, it, it mainly is, is measuring stress on our health system because of COVID patients, but right. our, our health system is also stressed by absenteeism that is not reflected there. That's right. Um, and so it really is not a useful metric at this time. Um, I know. And it, it would only be helpful when it, it were, when it's positive. I mean, when it's, red that's helpful but when it's green it's not helpful because it doesn't truly reflect what's going yeah. on there yeah it's sort of the um last possible red flag thrown of like things are not good by the time that has moved into um high level it's like oh that's really not good <laughs> um and it's alarming that so much of our country is actually in that red zone if you zoomed out um you'd see large swaths of the country uh, the counties are categorized in the high zone, which from that very, um, you know, I don't know what to call it, conservative or not conservative metric of like, how bad is COVID? Like even by that standard, it's really a lot of COVID out there stressing the hospitals. Joanne, um, when you say absenteeism, are you speaking about um, acute absenteeism, people who have are out on sick leave or are you talking about uh, unfilled positions and short staff? Uh, well, both. We have a baseline. Even before COVID, we had a baseline sort of short being short staffed. I mean, you know, healthcare. We were um, having a shortage of healthcare workers, and then COVID came, and we have many more open positions. But on top of that, we do see the ebb and flow 
with every surge that we have, we see a bunch of healthcare workers out, you know, because of COVID. And so that so deeply affects how the hospitals function um, and clinics and other places, but, and that's not really measured anywhere. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I think we've spoken previously about that information not being available actually to us. Yeah, I've actually spoken to uh, the Mass General folks about that. And um, I think I can push on that a little bit, but I don't think there was actually, a, I don't know what kind of metric they could provide about that. Right. Um, but the um, one other piece of information that I didn't get for today, but in the future is I did get permission to share um, percent positivity um, for asymptomatic patients. We do a lot of uh, screening of patients before surgery, for example, that asymptomatic folks, and that can be a very telling number. It, you know, can give you a sort of a, a good just just all to, to use in your own life, for example. I mean, if you walk into a restaurant of 100 people, uh, assuming they are asymptomatic, how many of them are likely to have COVID? I mean, it just sort of gives you, it's very sort of a tangible kind of number. And I think it can be really helpful. So for next time, I will will provide that. So now I have permission to share that. That's great. Yeah, I think that's a, one of those metrics that helps you see what the silent spread is. Mm -hmm. uh, we keep talking about the silent spread, but like, what does that mean? Well, that's a nice measure of it. Uh, so that's the, the center box. And if we experience changes uh, in our CDC assigned level, then those colors will change accordingly. Uh, and then the bottom two boxes right now are Hampshire County wastewater surveillance data from Biobot. Um, and I understand that Northampton will be testing wastewater potentially again in August. And so we'll have more specific information updated there. Every couple of weeks, Biobot updates um, the variants that they're finding in the wastewater. And so that is included um, from last week. Um, which is not shocking, but primarily BA5 variant in our area. Uh, and then the box over on the other side is various local vaccine coverage. And this, you know, we sort of just put um, various um, sort of fully uh, vaccinated and folks who are vaccinated plus have at least one booster in there right now. And we can think about rotating through things like uh, by age range or by race ethnicity um, to kind of keep our eye on what's going on in terms of vaccine coverage. Um, there's been you know, some periods of months where that's been sort of stagnant. Uh, we are seeing some changes. In the past couple of weeks, I'm seeing a few more, um, you know, maybe a percentage point or so more people getting boosters. Um, I hoped to see maybe some more people in that uh, prime series group after the Novavax. Um, vaccine is widely available, so we'll see. And then also as our youngest uh, get vaccinated, none of them are far enough along in the process to be counted as fully vaccinated, uh, particularly if they are getting the Pfizer vaccine, which is a three dose prime series for, for the youngest. So we will see some changes as we move forward. Um, and it'll be sort of interesting to track as we move into the fall. So that's the information that's on there right now. Uh, we also have a graph of cumulative cases and um, uh, average daily cases over time in Northampton up in the top box. We can rotate that graph through to other visuals if there are particular things that folks have questions about. Um, I'm really open to whatever, whatever information sounds useful to you all. Thank you. I think it looks beautiful. <laughs> um, did you want to give your assessment of the current data? Yes. Uh, so I made a few notes for myself to keep it quick because I, I saw your email. Um, <laughs> I think uh, you know what, what most folks are talking about is that it's very clear that we are somewhere around the peak of this BA5 surge. It's not clear if we're at the peak, just before the peak, maybe even coming down the other side. It's too soon if you look at wastewater data to really, you know, if you pinch in that corner and look, uh, it's really too soon to know if that's an actual leveling out, but we do see it multiple places. So like 
in Hampshire County, we sort of see this leveling. We see it across the US. So it's possible that we're sort of getting some signs that we might be sort of reaching the peak in wastewater, which uh, would be great to see. Um, you know, what that means for how slow the descent will be or how low it will get before another variant comes along. It's really unclear, even if just BA5 stays in the area and folks who have been previously infected lose some of that prior immunity as time goes on, um, you know, we might see that sort of resurgence. So it just sort of depends what comes along next. Um, I don't have much variant updates uh, for you all. We are keeping our eye on BA uh, 2.75, which was first identified in India in May. It does seem to be causing some surges in some European countries. Um, anytime a new variant comes along and causes surges, it by definition, um, in order to become dominant, has to be more infectious than the variant that came before it. Um, so if you are sort of reading the writing on the wall here, we are talking about ever more infectious, uh, contagious versions of this virus, which is not great. Um, it's really hard to estimate sort of where contagiousness lies compared to some of the other, you know, uh, the viruses and diseases that we're aware of. So like comparing it to measles or comparing it to the flu or all those, we can sort of make guesses about where it lands in there. Um, but I think sort of the takeaway message that it's really at this point, very contagious um, is probably enough detail to keep in mind. So for folks who um, you know, are fully vaccinated and have their booster doses and who are low risk, um, you know, it is really contagious. Those things will not prevent an infection. Um, infections are still happening pretty uh, readily among even the vaccinated and the boosted, um, but their, their vaccine is keeping them from being very sick for sure. So they probably are sort of living in one sort of risk scenario. And then folks who, for whatever reason, either are not up to date on their vaccine and their boosters or are high risk for some other reason or you know, compromised, right? There's sort of this other world that some folks are living in where risk is really a lot different. Um, and uh, getting infected is pretty easy at this point. And infection carries some pretty significant risk, not just of severe disease then, but um, Joanne, as you pointed out earlier when we were talking, um, long COVID remains a risk too. And we're still answering tons of questions you know, we have way more questions than answers about long COVID. So does every time you get reinfected increase your risk of long COVID? Um, I sort of, I wrote about this for East Hampton um, last week or the week before where it's one of those things where two things are true. So yes, each time you have an infection, there's a um, sort of increase in your risk because you've been infected more, but the association between that particular infection and long COVID seems to be smaller each time. So if you imagine like a, you know, a graph that sort of plateaus um, or, or stops increasing so quickly. Um, so two things are sort of true, right? It, it does increase your risk of long COVID the more times you're infected, but each additional infection probably has smaller sort of increases. Um, that might be, um, all I wanna say, oh, we have the uh, booster, hopefully, Officials are, are hoping sometime in the fall, maybe early winter, Joanne and I were both sort of saying like, yeah, believe it when I see it rolling out that quickly. Um, I would say at this point, uh, I would not use an Omicron specific booster as a reason to not get up to date in boosters now. Um, so I'm recommending to everybody, if you are in a group that is eligible for a booster and you have not received it yet, go get it go get the booster. Um, it's, it's a great thing to have. It will not, from all the sources that I have seen uh, and epidemiologists talking at the CDC level, it will not prevent you from being eligible for an Omicron specific booster. Um, and with, with any luck, we'll have that maybe late fall, early winter, and that can help us for whatever is coming next. Great, thank you so much. Um, does anybody have any uh, questions for Megan? I, I just had one quick comment. Um, I continue to know a lot of people who are becoming infected, and I did not know people becoming infected prior to this. Mm -hmm. And I'm repeatedly surprised by the number of people who are surprised 
that they got COVID, even though they are fully vaccinated and boosted. Yep. I mean, somehow, I guess it's it's my own bias of how many times we've discussed it and talked about it, and how many how many times I've seen it in the press that it does not necessarily predict prevent infection, but prevent severe illness. That's been a theme over and over again. But many people um, didn't fully understand that part and thought that they were um, protected from illness. Um, they haven't been wearing masks and they know people who are positive um, and they're surprised. When they become infected and it's happened over and over again and every time i'm a little taken aback yeah i think there was some sort of maximum level of like information folks could take in about how what the vaccines are doing and what works to prevent it and then as the variants mutated and that changed it was like well <laughs> we're on delta information um but we're we're in omicron ba5 and you know, the, the old rules don't apply. Well, it, it's not their world and they want to be done with it. Yeah. Everyone wants to be moving on to something else. That, and I don't blame them, but do we're not it. there. Yeah, we're, we're not we're there. Any other questions or comments for uh, Megan? Thank you so much. We so appreciate uh, your, your beautiful work. Oh, thank you. If I can answer any other questions or if you have thoughts for the dashboard as we go, just let me know and I'm happy to do that. Great. Thank you, Megan. Thank it's you. our intention to get Megan the data, uh, Northampton Raw data on Fridays, and then she'll have something prepared early the following week and we'll put it up on the website. So I thank you so much for joining our team. <laughs> Great. Um, Meredith, did you have a comment on uh, monkeypox communication? Well, I, I think we're coming to a time where we need to start discussing it and thinking about our communication, what we're going to put out there. Um, I think it was on July 23rd, the WHO declared monkeypox a public health emergency of international concern. And the last time they declared that, it was for COVID. Um, so, I mean, the City of Northampton Department of Health and Human Services is monitoring the status of monkeypox around the Commonwealth um, and the city through communication with MDPH. Um, as of July 28, 2022, there have been 4,638 cases in the U.S. And as of last Thursday, there was 79 in the state. Uh, MDPH puts out the number of mass cases uh, every Thursday, and I haven't seen it yet for today. So we are watching it. The first case in mass was identified on May 18th, um, and we're just now thinking about communication. What do we want to put out there? How do we get it to the most um, high-risk populations? I had a conversation with Dallas, and was it yesterday, today? I, I lose my days, but um, we spoke, and they've put out or a draft communication that I think is just lovely, hits the points, very digestible. And Dallas, if you want to share that and speak about it, that'd be great. And partnering um, with Trans Health, I think is a wonderful idea. So I will give the show to you, Dallas. Okay, um, can I share my screen? I could share the draft of it right now. That'd be um, excellent. Great, thank you. Um, can folks see this? Let's see. Um, so, so yeah, so we at TransHealth Northampton are pretty concerned about monkeypox, uh, concerned about actually knowing the, the accuracy of the amount of cases counted, and really concerned about the stigma and the language that is used around monkeypox as well, especially after we saw what happened during the beginning of the HIV uh, epidemic. Um, we, uh, you know, there's been some language that's out there that's been somewhat gendered or based on uh, sex, even um, using language such as men that sleep with men, for example, or using language that is geared towards uh, gay men specifically, um, or bisexual men, um, which we know can be higher risk populations, but they don't necessarily include, um, they're not as inclusive as they could be in terms of language uh, and knowing that people 
uh, can um, have different types of bodies and different genders as well. And specifically at Trans Health, we primarily care for the trans and gender diverse population. So we've been pretty concerned about some of the messaging and want to make sure also that our the communities that we serve and really the um, the entire, not just the trans community, not just the LGBTQ community, but our entire, uh, the folks around Western Massachusetts um, and also throughout the Commonwealth too, um, are really able to get accurate and informative information and that we don't contribute to that stigma. So in at least this flyer, we did speak to, this is again a draft, we just really need to do some very basic kind of uh, copy edits, but we really wanted to speak to uh, the risk, transmission, how it's not transmitted, uh, reducing risks of transmission. And I wanna give uh, full props to our uh, primary care director, Dan Delgado, who uh, really put this together along with our communications lead to uh, Mel Da Silva. Um, we speak to as well the treatment, um, helping to reduce stigma um, and talking about vaccinations, if someone's eligible to receive the vaccine, if someone should get the vaccine, and then general information that links out to the CDC largely as well, because um, we just don't have the capacity to keep that information up to date. Uh, we will be releasing this at least to all of our patients through the portal and providing this pamphlet to our patients. Um, and we've also been uh, in communication too with, um, at least today, our primary care director was at the um, in a White House Zoom with HHS, speaking about uh, what the federal response has been, um, and uh, speaking to kind of convening different folks in different community health organizations, um, especially those that predominantly serve the LGBTQ community, to better understand their own responses and how the government can help. The last I have heard, I think there were a lot of activists and advocates from the LGBTQ community that were very, very upset about the current governmental response, um, questions around the actual case rate and how true that is, um, especially if people, some clinics or hospitals don't exactly know what they're looking for. Some stories of denials of, of care even too, or denials of providing vaccines, stories of vaccines being limited as well. Um, and so we at least wanted to start here by trying to ensure that there was accurate communication that was provided and that individuals knew where they could go to receive the vaccine and to also understand symptoms and transmission. Dallas, I absolutely love how we want to break down stereotypes and how we frame and craft the language that we use to reduce stigma. Like that's really important work. I mean, for the DHHS and I mean, not even going back to AIDS and HIV, also COVID, like early on in COVID. I mean, people automatically, um, you know, it was stigmatized that, you know, anyone of Asian descent, you know, brought COVID to our country. It just, it was, it was very scary. And I just, I don't, I feel like we should have learned. And I love that you're including that. And I'm hoping that you allow us to use some of the language that you guys have, have crafted on our communication, because I think it's super important. And you did a wonderful job. Thank you. Yes, I think you'll see in the language itself that there's really nothing here about uh, gender or uh, necessarily, uh, you know, sexual identity or, or sort of sexual orientation or gender mm -hmm. identity. You can see much more. It's really about what intimate contact means or skin to skin contact means, which then mm -hmm. de works to destigmatize. Um, and then we also really want to make sure our folks are aware of the two sites that at least I know of in Western Mass to receive the vaccine and what eligibility looks like. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and make sure that uh, other clinicians are aware of this too, so we have accurate referral sources to get uh, to help protect people. And I will say too, just on the communication side, we're really um, 
you know, we're, we're working with other LGBTQ health organizations to try to um, engage people on social media, whether that is through um, Twitter or Instagram um, or uh, through even TikTok. Um, and there have been some monkeypox TikToks that have been developed, I believe, out of Cal and Lord. Um, and then there's also been some additional materials that have come out of Fenway Health, too. Uh, and I think we're really, because so many folks in the LGBTQ community um, that may be at risk may also be uh, young, too. I'm not saying that that is necessarily a high-risk population, but it is an area mm -hmm. um, of concern that we'd want to really make sure the message gets transmitted in an appropriate way that people are really able to understand that. Um, Dallas. Thanks for doing this and sharing it. It's, it's just very impressive work, um, both in content and presentation. Where is the vaccine available locally? My, I saw the I saw the the link, but um, if someone asked me, I wouldn't be able to answer that question. Yes. Yeah, so so um, my, can, oh. I'm. Do you want me to? I can give the address. Okay, so Tapestry Health in Springfield. And um, I don't have the address, but the number is 413-586-2016. And then Met Bay State Medical Center Brightwood in Springfield also has the vaccine. And that number is 413-794-4458. Monday through Friday, eight to five for both of them. So but again, right now, there are very specific criteria because there is a shortage of who can get it. Um, and they have to be people who have, have some known risk or some kind of significant exposure. Um, everyone who may fit that, um, the, that high risk group is not eligible at this time. I believe from what I understand that the Either it's through known contacts of a case, and that's identified through DPH contact tracing, or presumed contacts, uh, and that is someone who might have multiple sexual partners within the past 14 days in a sexual network where monkeypox is known to be circulating. Um, and yes, the two sites have the vaccine available generally because they also serve very high, uh, serve patients and communities who are at high risk for monkeypox or who are eligible for PrEP or HIV positive. Thank you. Um, so Meredith, as far as the Department of Health response, you might use some of the language in Dallas's presentation and how, how do you plan to put it out to our community? Well, so that's the communication piece that we're talking about right next. That's on our, I think that's next on our agenda. Yep. Um, you know, it all depends. We have a list of communications that you know platforms that we use but it's always dependent on the nature of the information that we want to get out the population that we're trying to get out targeted audience um so i can go through that list and we can talk about it as we segue into the next agenda item but yes what i'm going to do with monkeypox is craft the communication um you know taking a lot of what um, Dallas has already done and using that language and we will put it out on social media and we'll put it out on our um, city web page. But I'd also, you know, I'm welcome to ideas. I know Providence Place is probably um, putting something out. There are other agencies I will tap into to see what they're doing for communication and if we can share information. Um, that's how I'm moving forward. I don't think there's any reason to um, do any type of press release. It's being, you know, at, at this level um, where we're at, but that's my plan right now, at least at least putting some communication out there. And, and Meredith, if you, if you need any help from us on the communication side, whether it's also trying to engage with uh, other local partners that may um, also serve those in different ways, not even health necessarily, but just different community organizations who could also deliver a message or um, something that we found effective too is partnering with other organizations. I mean, perhaps Bay State and Tapestry might be interested at least in spreading that message. Mm, yeah. Um, but there's at least from uh, like kind of engaging on the social media side, 
sometimes leveraging those uh, different uh, audiences and the people who subscribe to those audiences can then get the message out even further. Right. And happy to lend any support there on contacts or if you need any help with any kind of communications design work, anything like that. That's great. Thank you, Dallas. Um, do you think we need a either letter to the editor or some an article about it? Or that, I guess that would mean a press release from 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 the department that would be picked up by the news. I mean, something just just to state what we know, and you know, if we were to do one, I would really like to focus on reducing the stigma. around monkeypox and and the language that we use i mean it i think we're early enough on and where we're at with the epidemic that we have we have a chance to get ahead of it right now i mean we don't have much more information right now on what's happening with monkeypox except you know beyond what's out there i think where we can have an impact is with reframing language. Um, would anybody be interested in writing an article for the local paper or um, that happy. would be from from the Board of Health to disseminate some information, but also framing it um that way great um so the difficulty is that we can't work on a document together because of open meeting law um if you draft something we could have another meeting and review it or we could just we could vote to um have a letter from the board and trust you to write it um those are some options Suzanne, do you have any thoughts about that? The, the other option is Dallas could write it and send it to me and I could send it to the other board members and you could provide edits, but not change content. So you you can do, you know, as long as you. the mm -hmm. intent of the letter stays the same, mm -hmm. that's A-OK. -okay. We're not breaking any OML by doing that. OK. I certainly trust Dallas to to um to develop this you've already done so much work in this area i i wouldn't pretend to be to have any of the knowledge that you have so um if you're willing to do that i would i would thank you for doing that okay um would anyone like to make a motion do we have to have a motion for that what do you think, Meredith? I know. Mm -mm. No. Okay. So we have a consensus that um, Dallas and Meredith would would uh, write a letter that would go in the local paper and other places that seemed appropriate um, with information about monkeypox and with appropriate framing and language. Thank you so much, Dallas. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. Thank you. That, yeah, that would be great. Very impressive. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, monkeypox, it's an um, interesting subject. Um, and I, go I ahead. just also mentioned too that um, the meetings that I've been on with the federal HHS, they've recommended even using MPV rather than monkeypox to reduce stigma as a word, but mm -hmm. it's a difficult that's that even that is difficult, right? Because um, then do people who have heard monkeypox really even understand what MPV is, right? So I think that there's some recommendations around stigma that are more so, um, you know, ideals, but perhaps not entirely possible in a public health approach. And it'd be, you know, I'll, I'll definitely draft something up and um, then confer with Meredith. And, um, you know, I think some of the recommendations may be time sensitive. I think yeah. those could change over time too. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. That's interesting. 
Um, and that sort of segues um, into our discussion of, um, in general, a communication plan. And I'm sorry, Cynthia couldn't be here tonight because I know this is her particular interest. Um, in, for example, when we had the mask advisory or the advisory for um, pharmacies and um, and grocery stores to have an, um, everyone mask hours and things like that. How do we put that information out there? Um, what are what are the best ways to do that? And and obviously we would need support from the department to do those things. Um, and the department has only so much time available for us. Um, so how can we be efficient and yet um, put out the information that we want to put out? Well, I think we still should own, the department still should own getting the communication out to the right audiences. And of course, if you have additional suggestions on where it should go, the department can do that. That's very much operations and we can handle that. Um, and we have, you know, um, listservs for a, a very diverse types of businesses out there, you know, horse owners, if we are facing a threat of triple E, daycares, nursing homes. So we have all of these resource lists already. Um, so we're, we're happy to continue with putting it out there. I think, Joanne, what you're trying to say is, you, the board, had these wonderful advisories that you worked really hard in crafting, and you didn't see them anywhere, right? But we did put the press, we did do a press release for them. I, when we put press releases out, not everything gets picked up. Um, depends what's happening on the news, right? And how newsworthy is this really? So you have that. But we also sent those informations directly to the businesses that we were asking to do something. So our grocery stores got that via email. And I think even maybe snail mail, we might've sent it out. Um, but so it is getting out there, but I, I understand that you guys didn't see it happening. So we're still happy to take on the communication piece here. And I kind of just wrote down the types of platforms that we use for communication. Of course, we have our city website and then we have the DHH website, DHHS website. We use radio all the time. I'm sure you hear Kate Kelly or myself on, you know, D WHMP talking about something. We've been on NPR. I've been on, um, oh, I can't even remember it. Channel 57 there. What is that called? Public TV, yeah whatever that show is, I've been on there a couple of times, social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, we do our press releases, we do op-eds, our community partners, we rely them a, a lot on getting our information out there. We use schools, we use our code red, we use Northampton open access. Um, sometimes we've even used billboards, we have rented space on billboards. We do coffee hour with public health professionals. We've done Zoom meetings for, you know, um, certain populations. We've done, you know, mailings. Um, if we're trying to have, if we have an initiative that we're doing within Northampton Housing Authority properties, they have a newsletter and they've also have a phone system and they've done flyers for us. We've done flyers all around town. We physically have people walk the beat and get the message out. We use our libraries. So those are just kind of what I could think of the top of my head, platforms that we've used to get information out there. But again, it's very much targeted, you know, it, it goes out by targeted populations or the type of the message that we're we're trying to get out. So if you guys can think of other ways to get messages out when we're doing this and that that's wonderful great well thank you that's good to know for example that um masking hours for groceries and pharmacies i know uh, cynthia had some concerns that we didn't see it go anywhere but sounds like it did go um and we actually haven't followed up on whether any any uh of those businesses have instituted those um 
but um, thank you for letting us know that you have a lot of uh, resources available. Um, so, so maybe um, the next time we have something that we want to go out that can be part of our discussion is like, what are the best ways to send it out? And, you know, we can be sure that we're sending it the way we want it to be sent. I'm looking to get a uh, communication intern, so that'll be helpful too. Mm -hmm. One of um, our the, our weaknesses within the public health excellence um, grant that we're working on with 17 community members in Hampshire County is getting the information out there in a very timely fashion and everybody wants to receive it in different ways. So we're trying to figure that out. So I figured having an intern do that um, would be super helpful, but they can work on this project also. Sounds great. Great. Thank you for for, uh, for thinking thinking about this. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> because sometimes we do feel like we we do the work and we're not sure it goes anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's great. Um, any other um, thoughts or comments about communications? All right, um, Meredith, did you want to say something about uh, wastewater? Yeah, that would be great. Um, so I don't know if you all remember, but uh, the city was an early adopter of wastewater testing effluent back in, I think it was 2017 or 16, when BioBot was just an MIT startup. We were testing for opiates. Then early on in 2020, we were asked to take part in a pilot program through MDPH to test the wastewater for COVID. The wastewater data did prove to be useful a little bit when you were looking at it for trends. The data pretty much on a consistent, consistently was able to predict a week in advance if we'd be seeing an uptick and then conversely a week in advance when we'd start seeing cases going down. Um, but again, this was very, very early on. I think a lot has probably changed. I was talking to BioBot last week because um, I'm very interested in testing our wastewater again. But one of my questions was, are they able to test for variants? And the answer is yes. And they can even detect if there is a variant that's not recognized. So they wouldn't be able to report out to the city of Northampton uh, from our samples, the percentage of the variants found, but cumulatively they are working on that within the system. So just to kind of remind you of how it works, um, BioBot will provide us with the sample collection hardware, uh, the detailed sampling training instructions so they can use that at DPW, though they are pretty well versed in how to do it. They give us the mail-in kits and then uh, they isolate the, the unique genetic signature of SARS-CoV-2 and analyze the amount of virus that's present in the effluent. Then they estimate the prevalence of COVID-19 in our population and we usually get that within uh, one or two days after they receive um, our, our sample. So I talked to DPH, they're willing to fund it this time. Last time we had to pay it, I think we were paying about $700 a week to have our wastewater tested. Um, this time DPH has given me a commitment that they will fund this for the city of Northampton until the end of June, 2023, which is excellent. And we can test anywhere from two to four times a week. I think we'll start off with two times a week because as it's not gonna cost us any money for the testing, it does cost in terms of um, Donna Lascalia, who is the superintendent DPW, her staff's time for, for collecting the samples and sending them in. So I'm super, jazzed about this. I asked the mayor the other day if she was okay and Donna if we move forward on this and they got the A-OK. -okay. And I would love on uh, Megan's graph, the county graph to overlay the city of Northampton to see how it compares. I think that would be, yeah, really, really fascinating. So that's in the works and we're hoping that uh, 
I was going to say the first week of August, but that's this week coming up, um, maybe within two weeks that we have all the systems in place that we can start with the collection and testing. That's just great news, Meredith. Yeah, it's, news. it's another tool in our box, right? right. There, mm -hmm. So. Yeah, excellent. Any other questions or comments? Thank you again. I don't know how you got DPH to pay for that. I was just going <laughs> to jump in and say that I, I think that's so great that um, you're able to do that. I think that's going to be such an important tool for the immunocompromised and the high risk to be able to make decisions about how to interact in the community. Um, you know, I think that group is feeling more and more uh, left behind in, in COVID and certainly in the MVP um, epidemic, we're going to see similar things happening where groups are starting to feel like attention is not being paid and, and it's so important that we have a tool for folks to uh, analyze their own risk. I'm glad we're doing that. Yeah. And I'd, I'd like to give credit where credit is due and thank Senator Comerford. She hooked us up. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, that's all we had for a new business for the moment. Um, the mask advisory that we put out a few months ago, last time we met, we decided to keep it in place because rates had not really dropped and we were anticipating the BA5 surge. And from our most recent map, it looks like things are steady, haven't really dropped yet. Anybody have any thoughts or comments about our current mask advisory? Meredith? Joanne, I would like to take advantage. I feel we have um, Western Mass News on the Zoom call with us. If you can really explain the difference between an advisory and a regulation and really be clear and hopefully that they'll run, a, because a lot of people were confused about it when we put it up last time. So if you just want to kind of give an overview of what the mask advisory is, that would be super helpful. Um, well, so a few months ago, um, when we saw rates going up, um, we decided to put out an advisory and which is um, a recommendation on what we think is best practice. Um, <clears throat> and um, our recommendation was that all folks um, who wanted to protect themselves from COVID uh, should wear a well-fitting mask, KN95 or N95, um, when in indoor, um, crowded indoor spaces. Um, and we thought that it was important because we're not getting that advice from the CDC right now, and we thought it was best practice. Um, and so we thought it was important that people know that. Um, so there's, there's right, this feeling that people are sort of done with COVID and people are just want to let go of their masks and they're not hearing it on the news. They're not hearing it from the CDC that actually wearing a mask in indoor spaces is really a good thing to do to protect oneself. Maybe some people don't care if they get COVID, but for anyone who does care, it's not just for immunocompromised people. And when their rates are this high, when there's that much COVID in the community, that's something that makes sense to do. Um, so we thought it was important for people to know that, and therefore we wrote a mask advisory. It's posted on our website. Yes, Meredith? Yes. Um, so if you wanted to look at it, um, <clears throat> And um, we review our um, our recommendations and um, and regulations regularly. And so for every meeting we go over, do we think, still think that this is appropriate? And given our data that we saw today, that the wastewater levels have not yet dropped down to us, um, and transmission on that CDC map is uh, still red everywhere. Um, that we still think it's that's what we advise folks to do. Um, is to mask uh, when in indoor spaces. Um, and there are some people who also at this point think that, you know, masking in some outdoor crowded spaces as well. Um, you know, if you're close together at a concert kind of thing. Um, because this BA5 is really more transmissible, significantly more transmissible than the original um, SARS-CoV-2. So um, we would love to get the word out. Um, that this is still the recommendation. Mm -hmm. And if you walk around town in Northampton, you will see, because we also gave um, 
uh, the, the advisory, but we also gave a poster or a sign, um, which is very clear. And some of the establishments downtown have that and they put it right in their windows. So the tool was useful. Oh, mm -hmm. what's not, what, what does the sign say? Well, they posted the advisory oh. and um, I think Amy made the, the, the poster, correct? It was just a picture of a mask. You're muted. I think that we used our old um, mask. Oh, mm -hmm. I think Kelly actually put it together with the um, advisory. Mm -hmm. So it is be being utilized, which is great. And there are some businesses that still require masks, which right. in Northampton. I think it's important to state that this is not a mandate. Right. This is a recommendation best on based on our knowledge of the situation and recognizing the, the transmissibility that if you want to protect yourself from COVID and to protect others, it's our recommendation to wear a mask, not a mandate. I think that gets confused all the time. Mm -hmm. um, any other thoughts or comments? Thank you. Um, I just want to get a, a little bit of an update on our ventilation um, task force. Um, we had a meeting this morning. We get a lot of work done. Um, so we have um, this uh, task force that presented, uh, I think it was last month we met, we presented just sort of the how and why of, uh, of um, improving indoor ventilation um, and how it um, <clears throat> um can decrease um virus in the air and and increase safety in indoor public spaces um and so um you know there's the arpa money which is the federal money that came into northampton or it will be coming into northampton and there is some of that money is earmarked for small businesses <clears throat> and um so we have a task force going in the department of health um under amy um that is aiming to give grants to small businesses uh to help them improve their ventilation um if they have a central um air system uh it might help them purchase upgraded um filters for their for their system if they don't have a central air system it would help them purchase hepa filters um and appropriate to the size of their of their dining rooms, etc. Um, and so uh, um, the ARPA um, call for proposals is not yet out. We anticipate that will be out in September. But in the meantime, we're going to come up with sort of the start writing what we think, how, how we would want to do that. And we were thinking of giving grants maybe as much as $1,000 for businesses. Um, and focusing primarily on bars and restaurants because those are places where people can't mask. Um, and if we don't have that many applicants or we have um, extra money, then we would consider um, businesses such as, let me look at my notes, um, home day cares, yoga studios, massage therapists, like people that work intimately in small spaces, um, gyms, hair salons, barbers, um, so those would be sort of the second tier. Um, <clears throat> so we're working on how that might look. We got a very nice um, offer from a Amy Kaylin from the downtown. It's the DNA. What does the N stand for? Downtown Northampton Association. Association. Yeah. It's sort of like what used to be the BDA or something yeah. like that. Um, Anyway, Amy K, there was a question about how these grants would be administered, meaning where the money flow from, because Northampton City doesn't want to have to micromanage the money. Um, and so Amy K. Helene and the DNA has offered to use her office as the location um, to administer the grants and having our ventilation task force be the um, deciders on sort of how, how the grants are administered, who, who who gets the grants and for how much. We have, we're going to create a form for, an easy form, we hope, for businesses to apply. 
And so we would be the decision makers and uh, Amy's office would be, you know, writing the, receiving the money and writing the checks. Um, so we have uh, something, um, a plan. And so we're going to flesh out that plan and hopefully move forward um, when we get that information from the city on exactly what they want. Joanne, I have two yes. questions and I might not have heard it well. Mm -hmm. um, who's putting in the actual application to the city? Is that Amy? Um, I think it would be Amy with our input. Yes, she. Okay. The, the DNA is is submitting several for several grants yeah. for different things. Yeah. So we would be one of one of her. Um, okay. Yeah. And then who's making the decisions on who gets it? The task force, ventilation task force. But that is a DHHS representative and a board of health member, and additionally two other people. I don't. I'm not sure ethically. Well, we can talk about that if we want to. Okay, yeah, I think we'll have to. How do we have to do that? I because mean, we, we do have, have some community members on our task force, um, but there's only, what, five of us all total. If we needed to bring in some more people, I guess we could um, and have the I'm, yeah, some I'm, us drop out. Yeah, okay. And I can clarify that Amy is putting it, she already has a proposal um, that she's doing for small businesses. And it would, this would, I think how I understood it today is that this would be another proposal under her umbrella and she would be submitting it. But but she wouldn't be making the decision. So we'd no, have to figure no. out who the proper group for decision-making would be. Yeah, that was the first, uh, to Meredith's first mm -hmm. question. And just to be clear, this is all, in draft format this is all just a proposal um it, nothing's finalized mm -hmm. uh so this is just um it was an offer from amy to us to um help us um administer that um and um on the education front uh we are scheduled to present our um ventilation uh, PowerPoint, like we did for you guys last time at the, now what's that group? Emergency Preparedness Group? HPHC. Yep, sorry, go ahead. Mm -hmm. The Hampshire County Co uh, Preparedness, no. The Hampshire, Hampshire County Public Health Coalition. Public Health. <laughs> <laughs> so that uh, attendees would be representatives of other local boards of health in Hampshire County. Um, so we're, we'll be presenting that talk in September um josh is going to try to get it on our um local television channel um if we are looking for ideas for how else to get that information out there we have a a youtube that's ready to go to be posted um and where else we could who else might be interested where else we could share that i don't know if anybody has ideas well if you have um nicely packaged literature i think as our inspectors go out they can drop it off at least to kind of do the inter you know not talk about it but leave it with the owner and manager of yes we have a handout yeah that uh, amy is just going to update with a, um the website of the ventilation powerpoint and just to say that you know we may have some grant money available keep your eyes out for that information um, and then um, we can give that to the inspectors. So as they go out, they will be handing that information. It's very sort of simple flow sheet about, you know, if you have this kind of space and this kind of ventilation, here's some ideas about how to upgrade it or to optimize it, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's moving along nicely. Um, any other comments, thoughts, ideas for ventilation? Um, I recall that there is a set aside for COVID or COVID prevention or COVID recovery under the ART funds. It, am I remembering that correctly? I believe so. And I think the city has decided to put aside that money all for Department of Health use as the pandemic goes on for testing, for whatever else is needed. Okay, I just wondered where, where that was going and if some of that could be used for this purpose. Yeah, I don't know if we would fall under 
I assumed we would fall under the small business grants, but um, I seem to recall a comment that the COVID money is all set aside for public health use. Um, I don't know, we can inquire about that. I don't know if you have to declare, we don't even know yet if you have to declare what category you're filing for or how that works. Meredith, you need all that money? <laughs> no, I, I just wondered in that we talked about that as being a real gap in our prevention efforts and um, I, I don't know how much of the resources you need going forward and which will which would already be supported by other grant mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of our initiatives were supported by ARPA money. Um, but I, I thought there was a percentage towards economic development moving forward out of, yeah, but I, I didn't, I wasn't able to join any of the listening sessions, so I really don't have my pulse on that. Yeah, and the, um, the request for proposals hasn't come out yet, so it's not clear how, how it will look, whether you apply to a certain category or not. But will there be a request for proposals? that involves dispensing funds to, to DHHS, that would just be an internal budgetary yeah. allocation. So yeah. that would not be part of the no. request for proposals. No. I just don't wanna shortchange some, not that you don't have um, uh, pressing needs, Meredith. I just don't wanna shortchange something that was a real um, issue for us throughout the pandemic mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and a concern for risk. And um, it was, it's a sector that was particularly hit hard during the pandemic. So I don't, I don't want to shortchange those efforts. I want, right. I want there to be real meaningful um, um, improvement in ventilation of places in town where people gather for the next time we have to deal with something like this. Mm -hmm. I can inquire about that. Any other questions or comments about uh, ventilation task force? So we're moving right along. Um, Meredith, do you have uh, departmental updates you want to share? I didn't prepare anything. Um, what do I want to share? We have been extremely busy with the fiscal year end, and we had um, some money that we needed to spend down in our grants, so we were busy with that. Um, we've been busy with, um, we had a lot of vacant positions. I think I spoke to you about how many vacant positions last time I showed you our organizational chart. So we have filled all vacant positions except for Vivian's right now. So um, we've been busy with onboarding. Sherry Sullivan is giving our new staff some time to get them acclimated um, into the work that she has dedicated her last seven years of her life to. So I'm very um, thankful for her generosity and, and staying with us a few hours a week to be able to give some really good institutional background to our prevention team. Um, I've interviewed a few public health nurses for Vivian's position. Um, I have found someone that I'm really interested in and I'm hoping that they um, take the position once it's offered to them. Um, and then we will be moving on to filling the um, Division of Community Care open positions. We are going to be looking for an administrative assistant we're also going to be advertising for community responders. The administrative assistant will be the first posting that we get up. We're hoping um, that that will be out there in a couple weeks. And then probably by the mid to end of August, we will be uh, have the job descriptions posted for the community responders. So after that, our, uh, we will have a social worker position that we will be filling. And then I think our team is full <laughs> and that'll make up about 24 of us um, if I counted correctly. Quite amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you're moving across the street. 
Yes, and we're moving across. Not everyone. Um, we've rented, we've leased two two um, office suites across the street in one roundhouse plaza. So the prevention team will be there. Um, the division of community care will be there, and um, myself will be there, and Michelle Fari. The health department, inspectional services, environmental health, everything that Amy is overseeing is going to stay currently um, where we're at. And then we're hoping one day when we have the Resilience Hub building that it's large enough that it can house all of the services that we want within the Re Resilience Hub and the Department of Health and Human Services are connected to it in some way, shape or form that we are co-located. So that's my dream, my vision, um, but I cannot think of a space large enough <laughs> right now, or that's within the city's budget. But anyways, um, we're looking at that and have been looking. Great. Um, do you have any updates on uh, the empty board position? I have none okay. on that. Okay. I know it's been posted with the revised um, description, Board of Health member job description um, that you guys worked so hard on, which specifically our intent on revising it, it was to make it more inclusive because the way it was originally um, written, it very much sounded like you had to have some medical background to sit on the board. So um, CES helped with, uh, help, help rewrite that. Mm -hmm. Meredith, can I ask you about something that you reminded me of when you brought up Cherry's name mm -hmm. and, and back to the biobot. Are we still getting opioid information from them? Can we continue to get opioid information from them? Is there any discussion about that? So um, we don't get it anymore. We got it. I We got it for less than a year and our thought, you know, this was very much MIT startup, like it was just kind of went from theoretically, we'd like to do this and let's, let's try to pilot in some communities. Um, so what we weren't getting the data back that we needed to, to do heat maps, like what were, it was very important to us with what is the value of this data and it's public information and putting it out there what could be construed from it. So we were very careful about that. I'm not sure if they're actually doing that anymore. They do um, wastewater, they, you know, from that 2017 startup, they are now internationally known um, and doing wastewater testing for, for COVID. So I'm not sure if they're even thinking about opiates anymore. Okay, thanks. The last time we had a conversation with them though, the um, re regarding testing for opiates, they were supposedly moving in the direction too to be able to test for Narcan. Because we collect that data. I mean, we're, we are a Narcan distribution site, but we really don't know. We ask people to um, give us feedback if they use it or if they pick up another one, did they use it or expire? But that's that's data that's really not collected. Um, so we were hoping that Biobot could give us some information on that. But thank you. Uh, does anybody have any other questions or comments? Questions for Meredith before we move on to our minutes? Well, before we move on to our minutes, um, I I think moving forward. I really want our, our team is so large and we are working on so many projects within each of the divisions. What I'd like to do moving forward is invite one of the divisions to the Board of Health meeting to kind of talk about what it is that working that they're working on to keep you abreast of of what's happening in the DHHS. And I think the first invite should go to Sean Donovan to talk about the Department of Community Cares. And where we're at, you know, kind of discuss where he is at now and our time frames and moving forward and what that looks like. Great. Thank you. And that just keep on rolling them in. 
<laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, we feel very separated from the rest of the from the department. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, <laughs> that was not the intention. I think that was more um, COVID. Just we were hyper focused for a very long time on right, right. topic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um. All right. Anything else before we move to minutes? All right. Um, Kelly sent out revised minutes. Did everybody have a chance to see them? Um, um, any comments about the May 25th minutes? No, no, I don't have any for those minutes. No. Okay. So when someone would, would someone like to make a motion? I motion to approve. Second. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Um, all in favor, Dallas? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Okay, May 25th minutes approved as for this the second version, the most recent version you got. Um, then there was June 8th was our special meeting. Um, any comments on those updated minutes? I was absent, so I cannot comment. Um, I, I had a, a few suggestions, but they're not important. The, the, um, the gist of what happened is there. I would strike under new business one, two, three, four, five, um, the word ever. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think there's any need for it. Okay. Um, um, that, that's all I have for that one. Okay. Um, well, if Dallas wasn't there, and there are only two of us here. Meredith, can we vote on these minutes? We can? Um, Something like to make a motion? Uh, move to approve. Is there a second? Like, can I second it? <laughs> I guess I'll second it. Any comments? Uh, all in favor? Suzanne? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Dallas? Abstain. Okay. And um, does the motion pass with two? votes four that's not a majority you no know, your quorum tonight is three so the majority is two okay, mm -hmm. okay. thank you mm -hmm. all right and then our last set of minutes um was from june 23rd um that was our last meeting any comments um under new business ventilation education presentation um the fourth line i think that should be indoor settings plural okay and i think in the next sentence protective ventilation practices also plural practices and, inter and interventions okay um, and then I had one more question. Um, you, you spoke during this meeting about a follow up meeting that you had for the task force. And I thought that next steps were discussed um, as, as under new business. Is that not correct? Was that not on the tape? I thought what do you mean you, next steps for the task force? Well, I, I thought that, that um, beyond you presenting about um it's this sort of technical piece mm -hmm. that then you then you at least commented on the fact that the task force your task force would be 
meeting and discussing next steps or something. I, I just thought there was more than than just your presentation of the science. I, Honestly, I'm, I can't remember. Um, I, well, I'm, I may be misremembering and I don't have access to the tape. So um, that it was just a question I had and, and it, it's, it's not that important. Kelly, do you remember? Did you see that tape? Oh, can, Kelly can't unmute herself. Um, I'll ask Kelly if she remembers or if she was listening to it recently. Um, okay. Do you want to hold off on uh, approving the minutes? No, no, it, it no. Um, I think think the um, the science is more important, and you presented at this meeting about what the next steps were. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, would someone like to make a motion? Um, move to approve with those two small changes. Second. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? All in favor, Suzanne? Yes. Dallas? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Okay, thank you. So we've, we're caught up on our minutes now. Um, and our last uh, item is just uh, on our next meeting. There had been some talk about whether we would need an August meeting. Our next scheduled meeting is, I believe, August 18th. Is that correct? Um, I, I cannot meet on August 18th. I think that's when we had it. Um, that's probably when, I mean, that, I believe that's the third Thursday, but, I, but I can't meet that particular Thursday. Okay. Um, I, it, my, any, my opinion. Yes. We, we could use a break. We usually take July and August off. So a one month reprieve would be really, really nice. I uh, do you anticipate any urgent issues. I don't, no, it, but... I don't, but if there is one, we can schedule a meeting. Uh, comments about that. I agree. I'd be fine with skipping August. Okay, so September. If we need a meeting, we're tentatively for the 18th, but right now we'll say that's canceled. And September the 3rd, Thursday is September 15th. How does that work for everyone? It's good for me. The 15th is fine with me. 15th of September is fine. Okay, that works for me, Meredith. Is that okay? Yep. Okay. So our uh, tentatively next scheduled meeting would be September 15th. Any um, parting comments? Would anyone like to make a motion? Move to adjourn. Second. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Um, all in favor, Suzanne? Yes. Dallas? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Thank you all.